Good morning, Antioch. The brothers looked good up there. But when I heard Patrick in the background, I thought I was with part of the Temptations. With a, ooh. <laughs> What is church if you can't enjoy it? Why would I want to go to heaven and be around a God that is dead and not alive? So, um, you could take some of the ring out cue, that'd be great. Um, for this book, because I'm loud and I'll get louder, how many of you have this book, Autopsy of a Deceased Church? Raise your hands, keep them up. Don't put them down. Because when you say raise your hands, I don't know why people do this. I, that wasn't a race. This is a race, right? How many of you have the book? Okay, so all of you that do not have this book, you need to I have to keep your hands up. I will let you put them down. I know we're not Pentecostal and your arms get tired very quickly when you raise them, but we can do this. All of you that do not have your hand raised and do not have the book, you need to get this book because this is important for our church looking forward. You need to get this book. This book is 100 pages. Now, you're like, oh, my God, 100 pages? Are you serious? Like, half of the page is white space, and the book ain't even a, about a 3 by 5 card is about the size of the book. In fact, here's a 3 by 5 card. That's how much of the page it covers. Okay? Now, if you can read 100 of these, you can read 100 of these. Okay? Go get this book. Keep your arms up. It's not time to come down. Y'all need to go to the gym, Jesus. That's how you know you're out of shape. You lifting one arm. You switching, switching. Go get this book if you do not have your hand raised. All of you that have your hand raised, you probably already read it, so you have plenty of energy space. Okay, put your hands down now. Thank you. Lord, have mercy. All right, please go get this book. It is a great read. It is, it is, it is key to things. The Autopsy of a Deceased Church. The Autopsy of a Deceased Church. The title is, for the teachers in the room, The Autopsy of a Deceased Church, 12 Ways to Keep Yours Alive by Tom, T-H-O-M-S Rayner. Okay? Autopsy of a Deceased Church. It is a very key book for us, so please make sure you get it. Make sure you get it quickly so you can read it and you'll be ahead of the curve. It's the first time ever, because I know most of you were not that student who turned in your papers early. But you can get ahead of the curve and be prepared for what's to come with reading this book. Amen? Yes. Amen doesn't mean that you, that, that you, amen means you agree with what was previously said. Do you agree that you need to get this book? Amen? Yes. There you go. Thank you. Oh, amen. All right. So if you pull out your sermon notes, your outlines, I apologize. Um, I meant to give you the ones with the blanks filled in. Just simply because I don't like stopping to fill in blanks and there's nothing on the screens. Um, there is a technical issue that we are working to get fixed. Uh, but, you know, those things require tithes and offerings. So if you put a dollar in the plate, you know, don't be looking up there no time soon. Okay? If you put five dollars, don't look up there no time. If you tie 10 percent, you can start looking and be like, where it at? But the rest of us, let's just look away. Look away slowly. Okay? Yeah, I went there. I sure did. Sure did. Because that's how things happen. Amen? I mean, your bills get paid. You come looking for your check, don't you? You don't look for it to be a tip, right? You're not looking for a dollar a week, right? You're looking for all your money at one time, right? And so the church needs the tithes to things to do what we need to do. We just said, for the upbuilding of his kingdom and the spread of the gospel throughout all nations. Y'all recited it loud and clear. Now you just need to act on it loud and clear. Okay? I got one amen in that whole thing. Okay. All right. It's okay. So let's look at our sermon notes. Practical teaching for practical living. Practical teaching for practical living. Just in case you were wondering, I'll give you a preview. Next week, we're going to deal with practical teaching for practical living, raising God-focused kids. Raising God-focused kids, because it's Mother's Day. 
right? We're not leaving the series simply because it's Mother's Day. We're going to talk about raising God for his kids, and we're not going to focus on elevating mothers, okay? We're going to focus on how does God desire for children to be raised in society, not in your house. If he's God of the universe, then his applicable blessings of obedience do not just function in the domain of the church and the church member's home. They function on a universal principle. And so we're going to talk about that. So if you got some kids that you know ain't raising your grandkids right, this may be the Sunday that you say, the mother's gift I want from you, you don't have to take me out to dinner, I'll fix my own little meal at home, come to church and hear how to raise God-focused grandkids. I ain't getting nodded. Amen or nothing, huh? Not a nod, a blink. Really? I would have been, I'm excited. I'm trying to bring my daughters in to hear how to raise my grandkids. I'm, hey, start them young. Train up a child in the way they should go. And when they get old, they will not depart from it. When they get old is when I need them to know how to do this stuff. So they recognize what it takes to be godly women who raise God-centered children. I don't want to be that grandparent who's a, who, who don't want to acknowledge their grandkids. Ain't that Pastor K grandkids? I don't know who you talking about. I don't know them little bad. And I got to start out early. So this is what we're going to be talking about. Just to give you a preview. Today, we're going to talk about overcoming temptation. I knew I wasn't going to get not an amen on that one. Because if you say amen, that means you being tempted. Guess what? The opening of this message is the introduction to the fact that every person on earth is. Thank you very much. Every person on earth is tempted. We are all tempted. We are all tempted. And so we need to know how to overcome temptation. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, we ask God that you would take this time and Lord, you use it. Father, we need to know how to take this word that, that to so many seems to be encoded and decode through the revelation of the Holy Spirit how to apply it to our daily lives for the building of your kingdom upon earth and in heaven. We ask God that you would walk with us through the scriptures and give us everything we need so that we are not left lacking. But you said that you are an all-sufficient, abundant supply. And so we want to tap into that all-sufficient supply because we need you. Take it, turn it, twist it, contort it, shape it, mold it, form it, and place it upon our lives that we might become the outpouring vessels to be filled by the Holy Spirit onto those around us, that our lives may be a witness and not a worry. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. Every person who has ever lived has been tempted toward self-destructive behavior. Every person that's ever lived has been tempted toward self-destructive behavior. Self-destructive behavior. We're not even going to get into societal destructive behavior, family destructive behavior, relationship destructive behavior, financial destructive behavior. For the outside, we're talking about self-destructive behavior. Every single one of us have been tempted toward self-destructive behavior. There's not a person in here, and if you say, if you, if you say, if you say that, trying to combine two words together to hurry up, right? If you say that you have not been tempted, you are just tempted to lie. <laughs> sorry. I tickle my own self. I don't, I'm sorry. I laugh, I'm the person who laughs at their own jokes. My wife said they're not even funny, and I just laugh. And I'm like, I don't care what you say. It's hilarious. Right? Self-destruct behavior or actions. Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verses 19 to 25, that we, that he wants to do good, but cannot because the sin within him. This scripture, turn to this scripture. We're we going to walk through this thing. Turn to this scripture. Romans chapter 7, verses 19 to 25. If you go to the red writing, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you hit Acts. Keep going right, Romans, okay? Turn to Romans chapter 7. I want to look at this. I want you to look at this. I want you, if you could 
you know, put on your intellectual thinking caps for a moment and challenge the typical worldview of our society on the basis of scripture. Let's look at that. Romans 7, 19 through 25. It was so difficult to, to pick where to, to mark off those verses. In all honesty, when you read the book of Romans, you really, in order to get the context of those few verses, you need to start at Romans chapter 1. Okay? You really need to start at Romans chapter 1. And, and let me just, don't turn there, but I'm going to just highlight a few things so that you can see. In Romans chapter 1, after you get past the greetings, Paul has this statement in uh, verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, and it is written, The just shall live by faith. Paul almost sets up the premise for the book of Romans in saying that this is a very practical book on living spiritual principles. Right? And after he concludes that particular statement, he lists a def not a definitive list, but a detailed list of things that unrighteous people do. But when you read it, if you have a very critical outward eye, you will see everybody in your church or everybody that calls themselves Christians. But if you are truly holy, like you say you are, you'll turn an inward eye and see, ooh, mm, 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 mm. oh, mm, mm. ooh, that one hurt, right? Because he almost does a list of temptations. Whether you fall into the sin of it or not, you are tempted by it. And so that's what we're talking about is come, overcoming temptations. But he's talking about these are folks who went past temptation into application. Right? And so he begins to paint this picture. And as you run through the chapters of Romans, you come to chapter 7 and you get to this part where Paul begins to articulate his argument that the just have to live by faith and that grace abounds to those who live according to the principles of faith in Jesus Christ. And he begins to kind of tear at religious rules of living and begins to pull at the thread and the fabric of that ideology in a Jewish-minded, religious-minded, ritual-minded person. That I came to church, and therefore I'm okay with God. I paid my tithes, therefore I'm okay with God. I don't do this, therefore I'm okay with God. I do this, therefore I'm okay with God. And Paul begins to tear at that and say, really? No, 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 boo-boo. Mm-mm. That ain't working for you. Because he says to just live by faith. And he begins to tear at the fabric of that ideology, that thinking. But, but there's a, a, a nugget hidden within the mass that Paul presents to us that I want to point out for today. Paul begins to start in verse 19. He says, for the good that I will to do, the stuff I want to do, the good things that I want to do, I do not do. I ain't doing that. But the evil I will not to do, the shenanigans, tomfoolery, hypocritical nature of our own flesh, that I practice. Mm. Paul, who they took, let's just bring it forward, a handkerchief from, laid it upon someone who was sick and dying, and they got up. They would try to lay the sick folk in his shadow as he passed by. 
so that they can receive a healing from his very shadow, says plainly in Romans, I want to do good, but I can't do good. That's in verse 19. In verse 20 it says, now if I do what I will not do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Okay, this challenges the ideology that all people are inherently or basically good people. That it is circumstance and it is, it is, it is, it is external forces that push me into being bad. The devil made me do it. Use a lie. Because he didn't make you say that statement because why would he reveal himself? I ain't never seen a criminal break in and say, I'm here. Call the police. I'm about to rob Robin. So why the devil going to tell you that he made you do it? When scripture plainly says that it is your own sinful nature that pushed you into it. And it didn't really have to push that hard, don't it? I mean, it ain't got to push. When that person cuts you off, it don't take that much for you to cuss from there to where they cut you off till you get to your destination, and then call somebody on the phone or talk to somebody and get there. You know this month, and cut me the, and I, this son of a, I swear the next time this, if another, I'll beat that. <laughs> the fact that you knew every word that was about to come out of my mouth lets me know that there is yet a message in here. <laughs> right? Overcoming temptation. It don't take much because it's not outside, it's inside. It's inside. See, see, the problem is you keep trying to fight external causes for internal issues. And you cannot win a war fighting where no one else is fighting. We conquered this hill. Don't nobody want that hill. Right? You don't see burglars breaking into the homeless huts down on the river. So for them to spend $100,000 on a security system to guard that cardboard box is foolishness. And the fact that they feel accomplished that, look, my security system is so good, I have not had a break-in in my house the whole time I've been living here means absolutely zero. But we treat our sinful, temptative natures in the same fashion that, look, I didn't smoke crack this week. That's not your temptation. I need to stay away from drug houses. You ain't never smoked drugs before. Why? But what you need to stay away from is that late night creeper text. I'm sorry, I went a little too vernacular. From that late night booty call, phone call. I got caught a few more folk with that one there, huh? What you really need to stay away from is that internet page that keeps sending you email. <laughs> crickets, crickets. Right? What you need to stay away from is that ability that you have so fluently to tell what you call fabricated truth, what our president may call some alternative facts. You gonna get to that? Mm-hmm. Did you do that? I sure did. That temptation is not an external factor. The fact that someone asked you a question to receive the truth did not mean they forced you to lie. I could swear that that as far as I've as far as my understanding of the subject and, and, the, and, the, and the issue we have in our society about sexuality and pornography that I, I, I swear, I swear, computers have yet to turn themselves on. Type in inappropriate web addresses. Or while you're sitting there not touching it, it automatically clicks on inappropriate websites. I don't think they have gotten that far yet. I don't think Siri, if you don't ask her, searches for inappropriate places for you to spend your off time. 
When I go to web pages, I don't see things that, that just automatically, oh, see, the devil is trying to tempt me. I, 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 I'm pretty computer literate, and I believe that most of the things that pop up on your phone are based upon the preferences of places you've already gone. So if the bars and the nightclubs come up in your search history, that's history, not future. You had to have done it already. Temptation is a huge issue. It is a huge issue, and Paul states that even the most holy and sanctified of us, hallelujah, still be creeping around the corner. Where pastor at? Did you see Reverend K? Is that Sister Lord? Is that the deacon? Oh, hey, deacon, how you doing? I, I don't know what they're doing over there. Pray for them. I never forget. Um, someone once told me that um, uh, a New Birth Church, where uh, uh, Bishop Eddie Long was the pastor many years ago, he had this great idea of you know putting flags that said New Birth. You know how people put the flags of their team on their car when it's the season, and they put their flags on. And he had an idea to put New Birth, the church name and logo on the flags and and people was driving and you know he had a large church in the city of Atlanta if you don't know it's a, it was a huge huge church it probably still is a huge church and they had the flags and he had to get up in the pulpit after a little while and tell them he said you know what y'all take them flags off your car he said because I'm tired of driving by inappropriate places with the flags flying on the car so just, we don't want that kind of advertisement you take them flags off your cars and we'll just say, talk that up to a bad idea. Now, that's the same thing that I'm talking about today, is that we as Christians, no matter how much time we spend in church and in our word, there is within us sin that is drawn towards inappropriate, ungodly things, and we cannot blame the external forces for what was inside of us that drew us to it in the first place. I want to, I got, I got to nail that point home because in this society, every psychological institution that we come to is based upon the premise that people are inherently good and right and outwardly noble people. Even our system of government is based upon the human nature of goodness, that people will vote for what is best and not what is personally beneficial. And we have seen ups and downs and ins and outs in our systems of government because even our founding fathers, and I believe it was Thomas Jefferson who said that no democracy can sustain itself other than the ability of its people and participants to have a moral and godly compass when they step into the polling place. Because they will be inherently selfish. And if there's a number of more selfish people in this group than in that group, then this group is marginalized by a system that is supposed to represent them. So the inherent goodness of mankind is a flawed assumption in our society. And it is actually, I believe, I believe personally that it is a trick of the enemy to pull us into our own destruction. It doesn't take much. Just present the option. And our own sinful nature does the rest. Right? I cut you off in traffic, and all of a sudden, your sinful nature ignites and does the rest. I, I don't, you don't know why I did it. I could have been avoiding a child. I could have been avoiding another accident. And I knew I could cut you off, and we, no one would get hurt, and everything is fine. I could have been trying to get to my sick mother that the doctor told me. You don't know what's going on in my life. But the fact that I just sh in front of you and you had felt that where you was going was the most important place on earth that you probably didn't even want to go in the first place. Now you cussing me out in your mind, in your car and to your friends because the inherent nature of wickedness within each of us from Adam's first sin is now alive and kicking. And in our society, we are hedonistic by nature, which means we seek out our own desires and pleasures and it makes us feel good to cuss you completely out. <laughs> Don't it though? Don't lie. You know you feel good. You be like, oh, 
Ooh, there's a euphoria over cussing them out. There's a euphoria over lying to them, and I didn't get caught. It's the thrill of it all, right? I mean, think about it, right? We have whole cities that base their income upon our sinful desires. On both coasts, Atlantic City, Las Vegas, whole cities. We have whole festivals lined up for reckless abandonment of our own fleshly desires, right? Mardi Gras. Some of y'all like, ooh, was he there? Did he see that online? <laughs> no, I didn't see nothing. I ain't looking for nothing, right? Throw them beads and all of a sudden somebody get crazy, right? We have all kinds of things in our world that perpetuate the appeasement of our flesh. But here is the thing, right? Even Jesus was, a, was tempted according to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. Jesus was tempted in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. After you get past God's electric power company, keep going, and you'll find your way to Hebrews after 1 and 2 Timothy. You'll find your way to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. It reads this. It says very plainly, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. If you got a Bible, you know it's okay to underline and highlight for study. It's not sacrilegious. Underline that word, our weaknesses. You might want to circle our and double underline weaknesses. Right? Circle our, because they're yours, they're mine, they're ours. And they are weaknesses, not strengths. Our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Yet without sin. We think yet without sin means that he did not succumb to the temptations. Part of it. See, one thing I love about eating is I don't ever want to just eat part. I want to eat the whole thing. Right? For those of you who know, I love my orange cupcakes. And by the way, whoever left those in my box, I've ate them and I have not died if you were trying to kill me. And if you were trying to bless me, bless you, thank you. God bless you. I appreciate it. Keep them coming. Just keep delivering them. Okay? I got some orange cupcakes. Thank you very much. I don't know who was, but I blessed me and I've been eating on them. But I don't ever just bite half the orange cupcake and leave the rest sitting there. Right? I eat the whole orange cupcake. My brother over here talking about, man, I want some orange cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> right? I eat the whole thing. Get the whole message. Yet without sin, he did not succumb to the application or the action of sin, but also did not have within him a sin nature to be pulled upon for sin. Because he was conceived under the power of the Holy Spirit and not through sexual reproduction, where the sin nature is passed from generation to generation. He did not have the sin nature, but he was able to be tempted in that he had human flesh and desire. He got hungry. See, the funny thing is, is the devil never tempted him with something spiritual. He only tempted him with something tangible or physical. Turn this stone into bread. Well, curse God and, and I'll make you worship. Don't you see? I'll give you the nations of the world. All of his temptations spoke to his physical needs because the whole purpose of the temptation of the enemy was to cause him to be an unworthy sacrifice so that you would have to die still in your sin. Because you have sin nature. He didn't. So his temptation was a bit different. Not easier, different. See, you have something within you that if you're sitting at home and you ain't got nothing to do, the first thought that comes across your mind is probably something you shouldn't do. Jesus didn't sit at home and think of, you know, I should do something inappropriate. He didn't have that temptation. He didn't have that innate sense. But guess what? If you presented something in front of his eyes, his flesh, the, the tangibleness of God, of Jesus, was able to say, I am hungry. 
I do want to eat. And if eating allows me to break the will of God, the word of God, then I can now do that. That was his temptation of sin. And it would have pulled him out. Understand that he was tempted as we were, but yet did not sin. Because, not because it was easier, but he also didn't have innate sin. Think of Velcro, right? Velcro, one of the greatest inventions that ever came to parents who are too lazy to teach their children how to tie shoes. I said it because it takes work and it takes time. And, you know, I, don't, I just buy you Velcro shoes. And the kids love it, except the teachers hate it because they sit in class going, shh, 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 right? And so Velcro is a great invention because how it works is that you have to have one side that's kind of prickly or, or the plastic little things. You have another side that's kind of soft and it's furry. And when you stick them together, the little things get in the little things and they just link up. And the more you connect, the harder it is to pull away. Like if you put Velcro all over your body and put something on a wall, you could jump on a wall and stick. I tried it. It works. It's fun. <laughs> it was so fun. I have children at birthday parties, and I went to a place that had Velcro on. It was the, it was the bomb. You just hit the trampoline, and go, and you hit the wall. And it, you be like, hey, it's, I'm sticking. This Velcro stuff is magic, right? Right? That's Velcro. But here's the thing. There was a little child that tried to run and jump to the wall and didn't have the Velcro suit on. And they just hit the wall. Poof. Why? Because the Velcro only attaches to something that it can grab hold to. If you don't have the thing to grab hold to, then the Velcro won't stick you. So here's the thing. We have sin inside of us. And so the sin inside of us already creates a substance or a place that when the devil or society or life or your own desire begins to throw stuff at you, it sticks. And because of it, you have a hard time getting it loose because you... You sit up here trying to pull this off, and it keeps coming back. That's why we have to become a new creation in Christ Jesus so that he takes the sticky stuff off so that it has less ability to stick to me. And that's why we become more like Christ and less like the flesh. Because it is important for us to understand that the battle we fight against temptation is not against the stuff coming at us. It's about changing what's in us that it sticks to. So it is an internal struggle and not an outward fight. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. You're trying to subdue the flesh stuff, but you need to Focus on the spiritual stuff. And so in that, we figure out the place of fire. So here's the part, right? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Where are my small group people at? Y'all should have came in concert. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Okay, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation is overtaking you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape. Do you understand that we have to realize that there is a way of escape? That's your first blank. I'm not going to spell that for you. There is a way of escape. Do you have to, you have to understand? There is a way of escape. Why do we have to escape? Because something inside of us holds on to those things that are outside of us. And those things outside of us will hold us from getting to where we need to be in Christ. Right? When I'm stuck to the Velcro wall, I can't go get to the bathroom. I can't get to the food. I got places I can't, I can't get to my bed if I need sleep. I can't get to the places that I need to be because I'm stuck to the Velcro wall. And the only way to get unstuck from the Velcro wall is I have to either push away, but as long as I got the suit on, 
If I even walk by and brush up close to, oh, that sounds like some of us when it comes to our tempting things. If I get in the vicinity of the Velcro, oh, 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 oh shoot. I don't, <laughs> give me a minute. Ah. That's what happens. You have to realize that there is a way of escape. Do you know that the Velcro suit had a way that you could take it off? There was a way out of the suit. Every temptation, every temptation according to God's holy word says that he has made a way of escape. I put the suit on, but I didn't design the suit. But the person who designed it had enough forethought to give me a way out of it. Because they realized that I wouldn't want to live in a Velcro suit. But eventually, it's fun to play with for a little while, but after a while, I need to get out of what's got me stuck to it. And I need to get on with where I need to be. So they said, you know what? We should probably make a way of escape. It's amazing that humanity, in all its flaws, can sometimes have inklings of divine spark to give us principles and keys to understanding the depth of God's word. We have to be able to understand that there is a way of escape, right? There is a way of escape. I've told this illustration before, but I'll tell it again because it fits with the scripture. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 gave me a way of escape. I remember very clearly I was with my mother. We were traveling. We were flying through Las Vegas. Now, one of my temptations is... Five times, Wheel of Fortune slot machine, 25 cents. <laughs> it's my temptation. And I'm walking through the airport, and I'm praying, Lord Jesus, I'm with all these Christians on the way to a Christian usher convention. <laughs> Don't let me stop off at none of these here machines, because I hear Pastor Mitchell preaching that sermon where he said he was sitting down somewhere and a woman saw him. He didn't see her and saw him and said, I saw you in the airport. He said, now what if it had been and had I been sitting at the bar? And in my mind is, Lord, don't let me get on any machines so somebody don't walk through here and see me. Jesus! I walked by a slot of machines and I said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Give God glory for his small victories. And we sit down at the gate and in front of us is a bank of five times, 25 cent slot machines, wheel of fortune. And as soon as I walk up, you hear this, wheel of fortune. And I immediately went into my old school churchy talk, the devil is a lie. But the devil hadn't lied to me, it was my flesh drawing me. It was the Velcro on the inside. And so I sat for this hour layover. And I sat down and I just said, and I had just gone through NAP 27, small group curriculum, and that's one of the first scriptures, it's victory. And I said, no temptation has overtaken me except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow me to be tempted beyond what I am able. But with the temptation, he'll also have a way of escape. No temptation has overtaken me except such as is common to man. But God, he is faithful to give me a way of escape that nothing shall overpower me. No temptation has overtaken me except as is common to man. But God, but, 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 but God is faithful. He will not allow me to be tempted beyond what I am able, but with that temptation, he will make a way of escape because God is faithful and no temptation has overtaken me except what is common to all men. But God, but my God is faithful. He will not allow me to be tempted beyond what I am able, but even if it is, with that temptation, he will make a way of escape. So then I said to myself as I sat there and I recited over and over for an entire 40 minutes I recited that scripture do you know that now I can walk in Las Vegas through a casino through the airport and I hear wheel of fortune and I said the devil done lied <laughs> 
because God made a way of escape. Now, here's the problem. The challenge is to take the escape. Turn to Genesis chapter 39 and verse 11 and 12. Genesis chapter 39, verse 11 and 12. Genesis chapter 39, verses 11 and 12. This is Joseph's story. Most of you who grew up going to Sunday school might be familiar with Joseph. Joseph in the Old Testament is the one who is sold into slavery by his brothers, but yet ends up being the one who saves them from the famine because of his gift of dream interpretation. Joseph not only interpreted dreams, but he also had dreams, and sometimes he is called the dreamer. And because of that, Joseph was sold into slavery that Joseph is working in a man called Potiphar's house, who is an Egyptian official. Joseph, and, and we find out from the text that he is pretty much a, a fairly high official in the Egyptian government or military. We don't know exactly, but he has some clout and some influence because he owns multiple slaves. And Joseph is a young man who is very attractive because Potiphar's wife says that she looked upon him with longing. She looked upon him. She began to look upon him. It said that, that, that uh, she told Joseph to come and lie with me. She said, come on, have it. come on, man. We, we just friends with benefits. What happens in Potiphar's house stays in Potiphar's house. <laughs> right? And she says, come on, well, I'm, the, I'm the head of the house. Ain't nobody going to say nothing. Right? And, and, and so she looks at Joseph now, 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 let's go, just go back a little bit from that, right? In verse 8, it says, but he refused and said to his master's wife, right? Let me, let me, let me summarize, clarifies it for you. I can't be doing this. I can't do this to him. He's given me so much. He's blessed me. And the last thing is, if you look at verse, um, verse 9, the last statement is, and sin against God? Not only can I not do it to Potiphar, because he's been good to me, but I can't do it to God because he keeps on blessing me. Right? He said, I can't do that. Now, now verse 10 is, is, the, is the, I want to go start back at verse 10. It says, so it was at, as she spoke to Joseph day by day. This heifer here. <laughs> this heifer right here. It says day by day. Not week by week, not Monday through Friday, day by day. You want to talk about some persistent temptation. Day by day. Every day. Every day. Right? That she did not heed, that he did not heed her, right? To lie with her or to be with her. Okay. So... She started compromising. Look, you don't have to sleep with me, but just hold me a little while. Somebody felt the conviction. I just seen it. You, was, you heard it in your mind. Somebody done told you. We don't have to sleep together. I know you saved it. Let's just lay together. We, I'm just going to spend the night. I'm going to sleep in the living room. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not funny. Y'all really struggling with this stuff. Right? Don't, don't, look, look, look. You don't have to actually smoke it. Just sit with me while I smoke it. Ain't nobody asking you to steal nothing. Just look out and tell me if somebody coming. Man, you ain't got to drink with me. Just sit with me at the bar. Right? Ain't that... Ain't that slick? You ain't going to do that. So let me walk you. Let me slow walk you to it. Let me creep it up on you a little bit. Let me put it on close up to you. Let me rub it on you. Just, just I don't, I don't want to touch you. I, I don't want to touch you hard with the Velcro. You ain't got to jump into the wall. Just, just come up and just, just press on it just a little bit. It won't stick too long. You can pull away from that. 
If you jump on it, you're stuck. We're not asking you to jump. Just, 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 just take a sleeve and just stick it and see. See how sticky it is. Just, t just try it. Man, you ain't no addict if you get drunk every weekend. You ain't drinking every day. Just smoke this one cigarette and see if you like it. Right? She, she didn't, she went, she was like, lay with me. Come on. Okay, since you won't lay with me, just be with me. Temptation. Temptation. Here's the thing. Here's the key part. Verse 11. But it happened that about this time, when Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was inside. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. See, Joseph tried to take precautions to prevent his taking hold of temptation and temptation taking a hold of him. He tried, but he had to go to work. And see, honestly, I think that your greatest temptations come from not the places that you sometimes go, but the places that you frequently have to go. That's why the heifer on your job is always so fine. And the one at the supermarket that you don't really go shopping all that time, ain't that cute. Like temptation wouldn't be temptation if you didn't have consistent access. Did y'all catch that? If you don't have consistent, I don't have consistent access to crack. It don't tempt me. Right? That's not my temptation. I don't have consistent access to hard liquor. That don't tempt me. But some of us have consistent access to Googling with our eyes, looking at television, exciting you, but the show, the storyline is so good. You ain't worried about that storyline in that show. I remember um, there was this time that um, y'all remember, she, she gone now, but all y'all was up early watching the news, all y'all brothers, when Adrian Bankhart was on the news and the brothers would get up early in the morning and be like, you ain't never watched the morning news on Channel 3 in your life. All of a sudden, somebody said, man, you got to see this sister on Channel 3. You got to go look. And all the brothers started turning on the TV at 8 o'clock in the morning. I just want it on while I'm getting dressed. Because you begin to, 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 to see that what happened? The TV had constant access into your life. Monday through Friday, every morning it came on. And all you had to do was look at it. I never forget, um, I told them, uh, my wife, I said, look, I said, don't, don't test me because I'll leave you for somebody finer. And I said, and she said, who it is? I said, turn on the TV, I said, that one. <laughs> I'm trying to be funny. This is why you can't play with sin because I was trying to be funny. And all of a sudden, I walked in somewhere and there was Adrian Bankart. Do you understand? I turned like Joseph and was all up out. <laughs> I said, I ain't playing with the devil no more. I ain't saying nobody. I'm I ain't not my mind is I ain't never leaving you for nobody. I don't care who it is. Because if I say it, the devil will find a way, life will find a way to bring whatever is your temptation right to your front door. It'll come right to you. So the problem is, is that Joseph was in the house by himself and he was right there. And 12 says that she caught him by his garment. Don't that sound like Velcro? Saying, lie with me. But he left his coat. <laughs> right? Sound like Cinderella in reverse. She didn't want to go, but had to leave. Joseph didn't have to leave, but ran to go. Left his shoe out. I'm, I get a new coat. I'll be cold tonight. Right? He left his coat and fled and ran outside. Here's the problem. It's not the way of escape. It's the challenge to take the escape. That's the key part. It is the challenge is to take the escape. It's not that it's not there. The challenge is will I take it? 
For some of you, I will be completely honest, your challenge is you literally have to leave whatever is tempting you. If so-and-so on your job is tempting you to act a fool and come out your Christian character in any facet of what that means, then you need to quit your job. And I'm saying it like that with force, but let me make it clear so you not muffled it up. You might need to quit your job. Joseph was working. And what'd he do? He ran out the house. He ran out the house. He was at work and left his job. His coat, well, let me go back. That's my picture, my mama. Shh. That ain't worth it. That is not worth it. You need to leave whatever it is behind. Do you understand that one of the principles, and I didn't even put this on there, write this in the margin. One of the principles of overcoming temptation is leaving the thing that they're trying to hold you on. If your cell phone is the access point of the temptation, turn it off. Get a new phone number. Don't just get a new phone number. Switch from Verizon to AT&T if necessary. If you have a struggle with stuff on the television, then get rid of the televisions in your house. If you have a struggle with alcohol, then you need to get all the alcohol out your house and you need to start shopping on Amazon and stop walking through the alcohol section licking your lips. I just need a little bit of Clorox bleach. Let me walk back through here because this is where the soda is. Oh, they got a new. Come on, people. One of the things is you got to let whatever it is put it out your house. You got to release it. You got to let that thing go. You got to let it go. We just friends. No, you not. You don't need no friends that's going to take you to hell. Because let me tell you, oh, well, you're going to tell me that that's going to lead me directly to hell? No. Nothing leads you directly to hell. It slides your behind into hell. I don't get on a slide and say, do you mean this slide is going to lead me directly? You telling me that if I stand on top of this slide, it's going to lead me directly to bark? No, but if I get on the slide, it will. Get off the slide. Get off of it. Because it will pull you away from God. It will keep you away from the blessed life that God wants to give you. You've got to realize that. Here's the thing. Now, here's the hard part. Here's where the rubber meets the road. Sometimes the path is through the temptation and not avoiding it. Sometimes the path of escape is to go through it. Mm. 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 I don't want to go through. No. Ah. Can I just leave? Nope, can't leave. Why? Well, I got to go through it. But my escape is on the other side. I'll never forget my children. We went to, um, what's that place? Uh, Universal, no, Universal Studios Hollywood, right? And we were so excited to go to the Walking Dead exhibit. It was brand new. I'm going to go to the Walking Dead. And I was like, ooh, wow, this, this is interesting. And we started getting in there. And, you know, if you don't know, Walking Dead is about the zombie people on TV. Don't worry about it. It's not important. But it, it was scary. It was, it was a, and I, I'm not going to lie. I left my man card in, in The Walking Dead. <laughs> you go through there. I was cool up until a point. <laughs> and then it got real. And the brother's faith started having to kick in and prayer started working on me. Because here's the point, right? One of my daughters got to the door. She got in there and that stuff was, and the lights was flashing. And they had stuff like hands. She was like, and she was like, I'm out. <laughs> It was an exit sign just like that. She was like, I, no. I'm, and she was like, I will stand right here. You can come back. I will walk back through all these hundreds of people. I'm out. And we was like, no, just go out this way. And my TT, my aunt, she just, she said, I'll take her. And they, wa and they walked out. They was like, nah, we're not doing this. But you know me, daddy can't be no punk. <laughs> you know, so I was like, well, walk through it, you know. 
Plus, my brother-in-law was with me, and he's like this and like this. And I was like, well, I can't be no, you know, come on. I'm going to go with them. Mind you, my brother-in-law like this, he held his son like this. is the, He held him like this. <laughs> he walking through like, I was like, why are you holding my nephew like that? Right? Like this. He wasn't having it either, right? We walking through there. I was cool. I was like, okay, okay. And I, I had found out that if I keep a little bit of distance between me and the person ahead of me, the jumpy stuff will jump at them. And I'd be like, okay, he coming out. Ah, ha, ha, ha. That's cute. That's funny. What happened was one of the jumpy things didn't come out at them, and it was resetting. And I'm thinking, okay, it's coming over here. And all that. And so I'm doing like this. And I'm doing, while I'm over here like this, I looked at, oh, in the name of Jesus. My man car said, bloop. <laughs> he said, <"Hurr."> <laughs> <laughs> Almost pulled a muscle trying to run away from that thing. Right? So now I'm trying to get out. But the only way out, there's no more exit doors, is through. The only way out is through. The only way out was through. And sometimes our temptations and our issues, the only way out is through. Sometimes you can't, you can't run out the back way. I was so close to the end, and I knew I was so close to the end, that, that, I, I, that going back would have meant doubling back over what I had already come through, that the better situation was on the other side. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, that rod and thy staff that cover me. Sometimes you just got to go through some stuff. So, 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 so here's those scriptures that I put, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, Mark chapter 1, verse 12, and Luke chapter 4, and verse 1. They speak to Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, but here's the, here's the key part. Uh, I'm almost done. I'm about to run through these last three. They're real easy. But I want to I wanna pause on this point. When you look at that, you will see that in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, it says that, I believe it says that he was led into the wilderness. I believe that Mark says he driveth him into the wilderness. And Luke says that he was led into the wilderness. So you have three different authors giving an account of the same instance. And it's all by the Holy Spirit. One says, the Holy Spirit driveth, I like the old King James, it driveth him into the wilderness, right? Another says that the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. And then another one says, the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. Here's the funny part. Driveth, led, and led, that translate into the English or the King James English, actually is three different Greek words. Three different Greek words. One Driveth means to expel and force. It pushed him into temptation, into the wilderness for temptation. Then one of the leads means that it escorted him into temptation. And the other one, the other lead says that it directed him into the wilderness for temptation. That had me wanting to shout as I was writing this message, because here's the premise. Sometimes the presence and the spirit of God will push me and force me into a wilderness experience of temptation, but yet, on the other hand, he walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me that I am his own. And then the other time, while we're walking and talking and he's pushing me, he's also in front of me, guiding me. Uh-oh, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that he's behind me, pushing me? He's beside me, walking with me. And he's ahead of me, leading me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because thou art with me. I'm not in this by myself. He may have put me in it, but he's walking me through it and leading me out of it. Oh, Jesus. 
Well, then what am I tripping for? Because <laughs> he's got my front, he's got my back, and he's got my side. I'm covered any way I go. You can't get me from the front of me. You can't creep up from behind me. And you sure can't get on beside of me. Because God has led me through this thing. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Here's the thing. Possible ways to overcome. First one, James chapter 1, verses 13 through 18. Recognize your triggers. Recognize your triggers. Do you understand that because sin is within you, the battle starts here before it goes here? You can get rid of all the alcohol you want. The problem is you're over the age of 21. You look older than 40. They will give it to you without your driver's license. You just need cash or credit. So you need to recognize your triggers for your temptation. What is it that begins to draw you? Because, see, here's the point. The reason that we begin to succumb to our temptations, it's not the temptation itself. It is something in us that's in turmoil, and the way we've learned to cope with it before Christ was to go to the temptation. Now that we're in Christ, there's a war raging, and we're giving into it because it triggered the desire. Certain things I don't watch on television, I don't care how good they are, because it will trigger a temptation. Maybe you need to stop watching the game. Unless it's going to be where you can fast forward through the commercials. Because every time you see a beer commercial, you want to go get you a beer. <laughs> Maybe you don't need to watch. Maybe you need to get rid of your HBO, Skinamax, show at all time. Right? Maybe you need to stick with the Disney network, <laughs> right? Maybe you don't need to watch that stuff because it's, 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 you, you already have something wrong and it's triggering you. you. When you get pressured or stressed, your natural inclination is to pick up a phone and call, not Ghostbusters, right? There's a trigger response. Learn your triggers, okay? I don't have time to go through James, but I would love to talk to you about it, but I can't. The next thing is what Joseph did. Run, Forrest, run! Just physically get up and run away. Run away. Y'all think I'm playing with you. You looking at me. Preacher, I can't run. Then scoot, limp, walk, motorboat. I don't give a run. Get up out of there. If it was on fire, you would leave. Your flesh is burning with sin. Leave. Okay? Here's the next one. Luke chapter 4, verses 4, 7, and 10 is where Jesus quotes Scripture. Memorize Scripture. He did not care. Do you understand that the Bibles we have was not the Bible in that day? Okay? They only had the Old Testament because Jesus was living the New Testament. And so Jesus, they had, I saw a scroll for just the book of Psalms. There were like about 15 of those things. He ain't walking around with a whole wagon train of scrolls talking about, well, I'm in this wilderness. I'm going to need this in case the devil come get me. It's up here. No computer on earth can compete with the capacity of information that the human brain can process in mere seconds. But yet you can't memorize the scripture. You don't understand, preacher. I'm old. I can't memorize the scripture. Do you understand that you've listened to me? The fact that you see me and you're processing the colors, the sounds, and my motion without it looking blurry like a regular computer does means that you can process much more faster. And if you can't see that, then you might not be alive. And the fact that you can see that, even with glasses, lets us know that your brain can memorize 18 words of a scripture. I bet you if I started singing some song you grew up with, you would know that. Let me break out in some temptations. My girl, my girl, talking about my girl. Yeah, uh-huh. 
that's as long as the scripture is. That's as long as the scripture is. That's exactly how long the scripture is. Count the words. I can't remember the scripture. I'm getting old. You ain't heard my girl on the radio since you was a boy or a girl. I know I ain't heard it, but yet you still know it. Okay, so you can memorize scripture. That's excuses removed. Here's the other part. Here's the other part. Prayer. Prayer. Turn to Matthew 26, 36 through 44. We're going to close. Matthew 26, 36 through 44. It's the part with all the red. All right. This is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prays to overcome the temptation of his flesh to avoid the pain of his sacrifice. He knew what God was calling him to do. He was born to die on the cross. And in the moment of truth, he has to pray to overcome the temptation to not do it. Sometimes your temptations require you to get in prayer. Some of them you can run from them and you're cool. Some of them you can quote scripture at them and you're cool. But some of them you just have to sit and talk to God about them. And you got to be open and honest. You can't pray that Christianese type stuff. You, this ain't one of them situations. Your spiritual health and well-being is on the line and you can't be father, most gracious God of heaven above. Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, the first and the last, the great I am, God my provider. Look, that ain't gonna cut it. You be done, you while you praying, you be done, got all up into the temptation. Father, Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. Lord, you are God all by yourself. Father, I was just thirsty. We thank you. Got vodka in your water bottle or something. It ain't in here. <laughs> But you know, you up there, you praying so long. You need to be like, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I need help right now because this vodka here is calling me. Jesus! Jesus! You know, this ain't one of them. You one of them. Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, he said, Lord, if it be thy will, if it could help me, let this cup. But nevertheless, your will be done. And he's sweating drops of blood, praying to go to this cross. And he gets up and goes back to his disciples. And them knucklehead black folk is sleep. He said, can't you watch with me but one hour? They said, yeah, 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 okay, I got you. I got you. No, we good, we good, we good. I got you. He go back. One hour. Father. If, it, if you could, let this cup. Oh, Lord, nevertheless, let your will. He come back. <laughs> he said, trifling, no good. He go back one more time. And the scripture says he prayed the same thing again. Father, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, let your will be done. And then he gets up and he goes to the disciples and says, wake up, the time has now come. You see the difference from when he went in to prayer and the difference from when he came out? See, it's human nature that when you go into prayer, you pray and you look for help from human people. And you will find out their weaknesses and flaws. So you got to go back to prayer again and you come out again and you find out that even though they said they would be strong, they can't handle where you're headed. And so you go back to God and you put all your faith in God. And when you come back from that time, once you have put your faith in God, you come back with the strength of God. Come on, let's go. The time has now come. That's how you overcome temptation. Now, this is not a definitive list of if you do these four things, your temptation will go away. 
Preacher, you preached and I'm still being tempted. Yes. Remember the sin nature within you? Day by day, it is a process of sanctification, becoming more like God. Every day, it should get a little bit easier. If not, what you doing wrong? I'm going to be real. Because the Lord is the same God. So what you doing wrong? But it should get less and less. It'll never go away as long as you're on this side. But it should get easier. Like now, I go through, man, I could spend four hours sitting in the casino watching you lose your money and laughing and talking with you. <laughs> Sit right at one of them machines looking at you. I'm like, how much money you going to put in this machine? You know this machine ain't going to pay. We a little fortune. Yeah, I heard you. But what's going on with you? Why did you take that? Money? You know what? Let me have some of that money. Go buy me something to drink so that way I can get me a soda so you can sit here because I'm getting thirsty watching you be stupid. Sit there all day. Walk out laughing at you. How much money did you? Karif, how you just sit there and not play? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Oh, yeah, I still feel the tug. But it ain't a pull. Because there's less in me. You got a small. See, I got a little bit of Velcro. You might catch my sleeve. I can pull that off. I don't have a bodysuit on no more. Because God has grown in me and God's got to grow in you. So let me ask you this. You have to prepare for temptation to come before it is here. Here's the thing. You've got to prepare for temptation to come before you. You can't wait till you're in the middle of it and start trying to enact. Where that sermon at? Um, um, recognize my triggers. Check. Um, run. Okay. Um, there's no way out. Okay. Just memorize scripture. Um, what was that one? What was that one? What was that one? Um, he that's in the world is greater than he that's in the people on the streets. Um, uh, uh, God, pray. Okay. Um, Lord, help me. Um, oh, shoot. I did it. It's too late. You got to start now. You got to plan now. That's why I'm preaching it now. Because some of y'all going to walk home into the middle of your temptation. Some of y'all are going to walk home in the middle of your temptation. You know, like the woman at the well, the one in your house ain't your husband or your wife now. Let me look this way because y'all will think, no, nah, I want to convict you. You know that's true. But I don't have no way of escape. I swear there's two doors on every house. Some of them have four. A sliding glass door in your bedroom, the front door, the back door, and a side door on the garage. Pick any one of them. Walk out the house. But my stuff, what did Joseph do? You can keep that. My soul is worth more than that thing. You up here singing, Beyonce. If you like it, then you better put a ring on it. Why? You ain't making them. Walk out. Run away. Know the word. Pray about it. While you're walking, pray. Lord, don't let me turn around. Don't let me turn around. Lord, I don't need to be like that woman that Lot was married to. Sarah is a pillar of salt. God, don't let me be a salt. Let me keep looking straight ahead. That's why, that's why he said, don't look back. And, she, and the Bible says that the, she just desired Sodom and Gomorrah so much that she just turned around and looked. And immediately she turned into a pillar of salt. How salty is your life? Because you keep turning around. Think about it. Think about the saltiness of your life. Ooh, my life is so salty. Well, quit turning around. Walk where God is leading you. That was really convicting. Good. What could this become? How many issues, bad relationships, wasted time, money, or pain could you have avoided if you applied the principles from this message? And what would the rest of your life look like? What would the rest of your life look like? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I'm not telling you to be perfect. I'm telling you to be better. First steps, admit you are too weak to resist all the temptations that you faced. Admit it. It's like AA. That's why it starts with an A, I think. Admit. 
Hi, my name is Joe, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Joe. <laughs> it's been 62 hours since my last drink. Joe admitted he's an alcoholic. He's trying to get better. You laughing at Joe, but Joe's getting healed. He's getting delivered. Right? Admit that you can't do it. Believe that through Jesus you can access the strength from God to resist. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. He's not talking about your ability to get a new job. He's talking about your ability to live holy. He don't care about your job. He don't care about your, look, you got to get holy. Choose to commit your life to God by accepting Jesus and study the Bible in a church family. So here's your chance. If you do not have a relationship with God or you're not a part of a church family that's going to teach you the word of God, I invite you to come at this time. Our deacons and elders are up here for you to come. So if you're here, stand up. Come on, stand. It's easier. Object in motion tends to stay in motion. And while you're getting up and the Lord is talking to you, just come on down. Come up here. The reason why we do this is not to embarrass you. It's so we can celebrate you. Amen. This is not an embarrassment. This is not to call you out. This is because we want to celebrate you. We want everyone to see, look at what God is doing. You are a walking miracle because you have been saved by grace. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Your coming is God's miracle working in your life. So if you're here today and you do not have a relationship with God, you have not overcome your temptation through Jesus Christ, and you're saying, I need a place that I can grow in that relationship, then come. This is your time. Come. Don't look at it. Don't think about it. Don't be tempted to sit still. Feel the pull of God and come forward. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word, God, that you have given us, that you have given us strategies. But, Father, it's not the strategies that are empowered. It is your presence through Jesus Christ. It is the gift of God through Jesus Christ of the Holy Spirit that allows us to grow in likeness to Jesus so that we can grow closer to you and less like the sinful nature. So, Father, I pray that today that, that what has been said has not just been an entertainment, but it has been a life-changing event that from this day forward that someone will say, you know, it is because God met me and talked to me in my situation that my life is different. Father, we ask that if there's someone here, Lord, that may be struggling and, 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 and fighting against their flesh, I want to come, but I don't know. I, I'm trying to come. I should come. I'll come next week. That, Lord, even while I'm praying, that, Lord, the battle is decided in the heavenlies, that there has been an angel dispatched for my prayer that tugs on their heart and pulls them into a relationship with you. It's not about us. It's about you, God. It's about you desiring them and loving them them and leading them and pushing them. We ask that you would watch over us, Lord. Keep us and guide us. Dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. Let the words of our mouth and the meditations and thoughts of our heart be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our strength and our redeemer. And every Christian believer says, Amen. Come on, put those hands together. We welcome you here to the Antioch Church. All right, church, come on, let's say it. We are blessed, we are blessed to, be, to be, that's it, a blessing, a blessing to those that we, that we encounter. encounter. Welcome, welcome to progressive. progressive church. We're all people. Divinely provided.